to Battleground Nova Scotia now and our extended version web only chat with David Coletto, CEO of Advocus Data. David, you've been in the field the last couple of nights uh, testing out how Nova Scotians feel about their political leaders, which way they're going to vote. The vote is on October the 8th. Yep. Let's start with the big number. Um, it attention. looks pretty good for one party, not so good for the other two. Yes, yeah, Stephen McNeil, these numbers continued, you know, the good feelings, I think, that the Liberal campaign's feeling, whether it's our polling, the CRA mm -hmm. polling. When you look at all eligible voters, we, we interviewed 500 eligible voters Monday night and Tuesday night, and what we found was that the Liberals have a significant lead, and they're going to have a lead in a lot of these boards we're going to talk about. Uh, and that's important as we get through this. They, they do show up leading yes. at a lot of these and boards. So, th so this, this is important here. So in this one, yeah, they're, they're, they're the top dog. They got top dog, so 29, 16. But the important number here, I think, is the undecided. Um, even after pushing respondents to say, you know, are you leaning towards any of these parties? 35% still said, no, I'm not sure who I'm going to vote for. So there's still a large undecided voter. This is larger than the other poll that, that's been uh, out there, the CRA poll. Um, and so it suggests perhaps that there's still a lot of wiggle room, but mm -hmm. nonetheless, the Liberals have a lead right now. And just so people know, uh, you can read the fine print in the bottom of the text there, but this is a telephone poll. Yes. So this is a real live person interviewing a respondent yes. for a considerable amount of time for this particular That's poll. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And so when we take out those undecided voters, we talk about committed voters or those decided voters. When you look at that, that's like a traditional ballot. You can see that the Liberals have a 22-point lead over the New Democrats, uh, who are at 26, and the Progressive Conservatives at 25. Now, what's interesting is actually this is almost a flip of the results from... Uh, the 2009 election when the NDP got about 46% of the vote and the, the Liberals got about 26 And so you're starting to see that there's a lot of voters mm -hmm. um, who voted NDP in 2009. Half of them are now voting for a different party, or at least they say they're going to vote for a different party. And I think that's largely why the New Democrats are nowhere near this, is that they've lost half of their former base. So if speak. we can just bring that uh, last uh, board up for just a second, because I want to take a look at the bottom two parties, the New Democrats and the Progressive Conservatives, uh, both in your poll, roughly around the same level of support. Here they are again, yeah. New Democrats 26%, PCs 25%. And again, this is, uh, this is uh, vote intention across the province, not by region, so we don't know how seats will break down. But the Progressive Conservatives in the Corporate Research Associates poll you're talking about, uh, they've been down as low as 16 points, much lower than this. Right. This would tend, it seems to me, give Progressive Conservatives hope they might be the official opposition. And that would be really bad news for the NDP. Yeah, it certainly puts them in play. There's a margin of error of 4.5%, so they right. could be down around 20. They could be up a little higher. Um, but I think it's giving them at least hope that if, if they see this as a, a two-election uh, step to get into to government, then the first step is becoming official opposition. If we look at committed likely voters, so one of the things we learned from the other provincial elections where the pollsters didn't do that well was we wanted to understand how are those who are likely to come out to actual to the polls, those interested in politics, those who say they plan to vote. These are all how the questions you asked to find out who is a likely voter. Exactly. How do they compare? And you can see here very similar results. The Liberals actually get over 50% among likely committed voters. But look at the Tory number drops a little bit. So I think the challenge for the Tories is getting people excited out to the polls that they think that the Liberals are, are you know, steaming away to a victory. Um, and, and even for the New Democrats, who maybe some of them are just going to stay home. And that's why we see such a large undecided voter. In, in that last one we showed you, the pie graph, 51% Liberals, uh, polls, I've always said, are a snapshot backwards in time. That one is you're trying to figure out who's likely to vote. That one's close to the predictive one, saying if, exactly. you know, that's, it could look like that in, in a week's time. And we, you wanted to throw all three uh, just, again, to show a different, you know... Th th the different that, scenarios that could play out. That first, you can't ignore the undecideds right. a week out of the campaign. We learned that, I think, in Alberta and British Columbia particularly. Sure. But we also want to try, as a pollster, my... You pay me to try to figure out what might the electorate look like come next Tuesday, because not everyone votes. And that's what I want to zero in on, because if, as we try to look at why the polls missed something in Alberta, wherever, and some polls just missed it, in the U.S. election, uh, the common denominator, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, was the assumption you as a pollster make about voter turnout. How big is voter turnout in B.C.? The voter turnout was not as expected. I think same thing in Alberta. And it, it went was, up. It went up, right. And nobody's, everybody's been saying, you know, the turnout's, voter going, turnout's down. going down. All of a sudden in B.C. it goes up. And that's where, oh, well, who, who came out that we didn't think was going to come yes, out? Yes, and, and Canadian pollsters, unlike American pollsters, don't model, or traditionally we haven't modeled for turnout. We, we do sometimes wait according to different statistics, but we don't, 
we don't uh, assume that someone 18 to 30 year old is less likely to vote than someone who's over that, even though we know that's true. Right. So I think one of the lessons from British Columbia was that voting behavior was so different across those age groups and turnout rates were so different that it did that. impact the final poll results and that's why we were so wrong. Back to the, uh, enough of the geek stuff, let's get back to the numbers then. All right. Yeah, so if we look at leadership, okay. um, I think that's the next one that we're gonna look at is party leader evaluations. Do you have a positive, oh, we're gonna go to issues. So let's look at the issues now. So top issues, we asked this open-ended, we didn't prompt respondents, what is the most important issue facing the province? Jobs in the economy, number one at 35%, healthcare number two at 24. And an interesting age split here, older voters more likely to say healthcare, Okay, that makes sense. They're retiring. Sense. They don't really worry so they're much about the economy. And more. they're using it far more. Yeah. Younger voters more likely to say jobs in the economy. And notably, although electricity could tie in with the jobs economy, you, know, you could be thinking about that, but though we've seen a lot of uh, breath wasted on this uh, issue in the campaign, electricity rates not anywhere close to a top issue. No, it's not. And you know whether it's Muskrat Falls project in yeah. Newfoundland and Labrador, electricity rates, um, it's there for some voters, but it's not going to be a defining issue of the campaign. And what is is that economic management question. So we asked voters, who, which party do you think is best to handle the economy, economic manager of the province? And here again, the Liberals have an advantage over both the Progressive Conservatives and the New Democrats. When you've got the Premier Daryl Dexter going out there saying the NDP are the best economic managers. Keep mm -hmm. stability. You can't risk uh, going with Stephen McNeil. You can see here voters just aren't really buying it. 30% picked the Liberals. Still a large group saying, I'm not sure uh, which of these is the best. A lot of those voters may not vote or may, not, may sit out. But nonetheless, you could see where um, in the closing days of the campaign, the final week, a lot of this, because it's the number one issue, will be about who can you trust? Let's connect the dots between these last two boards and the vote intention board. The first board said to the voter, what is your most important issue? It's jobs. The next one that we just showed said, all right, which party is, is the best on the number one issue you rate, jobs? Right. It's the Liberals. Now, which party are you going to vote for? It's the Liberals. You line up those three things, it looks good for the Liberals. That didn't happen in British Columbia. And that's, again, one of the reasons why maybe people miss something in B.C. That's right. And, and that's why, you know, Nova Scotia might be the exception to the rule of incumbents continuing to be reelected. Mm -hmm. Because, as you said, when we did polling in British Columbia, yes, the B.C. NDP had a 10-point lead. But they trailed the B.C. Liberals on who do you trust to manage the B.C. economy. And B.C. economy was the number one and issue. It became the number one issue. And... Christy Clark was re-elected. In this campaign, the reason I think the Liberals are in such good position is they're not only leading in vote intention, they're leading on that all-important who do you trust to manage the economy, and they have the most popular leader. So you put all those three together and it seems that with one week left to go in the campaign, it's going to be very difficult, I think, for Daryl Dexter or Jamie Bailey to really get the kind of momentum you need to pull. Well, let's, let's look at the numbers for leaders. We just mentioned that Meet Neal is tops in that category, too. He is. So you ask them, do you have a positive, you ask respondents positive or negative uh, impression? You can see a majority of eligible voters in Nova Scotia have a positive impression of Stephen McNeil. Not just those who plan to vote, not just those who are committed voters, a majority. So it's significantly better for Stephen McNeil when it comes to his personal brand than for Daryl Dexter, who doesn't have horrible numbers. I've mm -hmm. seen worse for incumbents, uh, particularly, for example, in Ontario with Dalton McGuinty. And Jamie Bailey himself, pretty even. Sure. About a uh, third view him positively, view, view him negatively. Um, he has a little bit higher un, uh, unsure numbers, so he's a little less well-known than the other two leaders. When we look at best premier, though, again, you know, um, the liberal it. lead who here, who do, you want to, who do you think is going to be the best premier? Steve McBeneal comes uh, well ahead of Daryl Dexter on this measure, too. So one other check mark, so to speak, on the list that a pollster mm -hmm. would look at, the Liberals lead them all. And that's why I think right now they're clearly the favorites to win this election. David Coletto, Abacus Data, thank you so much. Thanks, David.